Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Welcome to my first episode. Every episode is going to start with something that I can find in my garden. The Prime Minister has just declared that we're all under lockdown. Nobody's allowed to leave their house unless they absolutely have to. So I'm going to have to be quite creative about the way we make these videos. Today's episode is going to start with this flower here. This is the common primrose. This is a native British flower. You can find it all over the UK. Its classic habitat is at the bottom of hedges. That's where it really likes to grow. It doesn't like to be too dry and it doesn't like to be too wet, but it used to be enormously abundant and there's still lots of them to be found. And in fact, they're one of those things that you seem to be seeing more and more of as people manage the verges better by the roads and motorways. They're really making a bit of a comeback. And if we look again closely at one, what you can see here is this is a classic wild primrose where each flower is on its own separate stalk. And lurking behind it here is something a bit unusual. I don't know how well we can see this. If I move those ones out of the way, we have a big long stalk and a great cluster of flowers on the top. Now that's not a classic primrose and it's something to do with hybridisation. So that primrose has hybridised with some other flower and we can go and take a look at what the possible culprit is that's caused that in a moment. So we've come to another part of the garden where growing in a different part of the lawn we have another primula species. So the first thing we looked at was the common primrose, that's primula vulgaris. This is the cowslip, that's primula viris. And you see that it's very different construction. So it has a single long stem and then a whole bunch of flowers coming off the top, which is a little bit like that aberrant primrose we saw. And that's because that aberrant primrose is almost certainly a hybrid between the primrose and the cowslip. And those hybrids do occur naturally and it forms something called an oxlip, which is actually quite a rare thing to find in nature. And it has the structure of the cowslip, but the individual flowers are bigger and it has the pale buttery yellow colour of the primrose. And gardeners have taken advantage of those things and they have produced hybrids in an incredible and frankly hideous array of colours and sizes. So if you go to a garden centre you can buy things called polyanthus and they are deliberate hybrids between cowslips and primroses which have then been bred to have wacky colours which well personally I don't really like. Okay, so what we've seen is there are two native primroses common, the primrose and the cowslip. And the reason they're interesting is because they have a really cool mating system. And that's actually what I want to talk about, the mating system of the primrose. So before we look at the strange mating system of the primrose, I thought it would be good to refresh ourselves about the parts of a flower. We've come inside because despite the fact that it's locked down, there are still builders two doors down making a lot of noise in their back garden and lots of people mowing their lawns, obviously, because it's been raining for three months and finally we've got a sunny day. So we've come inside to actually get some peace and quiet. And I, it's a really good time of year to remind ourselves about the parts of a flower because there's a lot of very large flowers growing in spring where you can actually see the parts quite easily. So I've brought in three common flowers. Uh, there's a tulip, which I have to admit I didn't grow in my garden, has been sitting around in a vase getting old. There's a hellebore and there's a daffodil, a narcissus. And we're going to start by looking at the tulip. So I'll just move these two out of the way. So this is a tulip. These are the petals and they are obviously dying now and falling back and they'll fall off. But the whole thing won't die because this green part in the middle here is the female part of the flower. That's called a pistil. And around it, you can see these little black structures and those are the stamens. And the stamens have a little stalk called a filament and then a black fuzzy head. They almost look like a little microphone. And the fuzzy head bit is where all the pollen is. So this tulip is producing black pollen. And you'll see that the stamens are quite a bit shorter than the, than the pistil in the middle. 
This fancy top bit is called the stigma, and that's where the pollen lands, and then there's a style, and at the bottom there are the egg cells. So that's a tulip. If we look at a daffodil, we can see something very similar. I'll just pull the trumpet apart so you can see inside. I can probably break it open, it's quite strong actually. And again, we have a central single pistil there sticking up and around it there are multiple stamens and they've got their little anthers, a yellow, much more familiar colour, uh, covered in little sort of dusty yellow pollen. And finally, if I bring in this hellebore, you see something a little bit different. So it doesn't have just one stigma, it's got five here in a group, uh, five pistils, and then it has a group of stamens around the outside. And you can see the way that they're sort of bending over, flopping away, uh, and the little top part there is the anther that produces the pollen. So this is a typical structure for a hermaphrodite flower, and that's what most plants are. Most plants are hermaphrodite. We find that a bit strange because, of course, mammals and humans and mammals are not hermaphrodite. We're either male or female. But that's one of the unusual things about mammals, really. A lot of animals and most plants are hermaphrodite, and that means they have both male and female parts. So what's unusual about primrose flowers is that they're not all the same. So there are two different types of primrose flowers that you can find and they are called pin and thrum. And I'm going to draw each one for you. So I want you to imagine that this is the primrose flower, and looking at it from the side, there's the stalk that supports it. Here's the flower, and imagine we've sliced it down, and we can now look inside. We've just seen that most flowers are hermaphrodites, primrose is no different, so it's going to have female and male parts. In the pin flower, the female part looks like this, we have um, the, at the bottom there, there's the ovary with the unfertilized egg cells inside. Then we have the long style, and on the top we have a little disc-like stigma. And that's hoping that the pollen will land there, and then the pollen tube will grow down the style and fertilize the egg cells. So that's the female part, the pistil. Now, they're hermaphrodite, so they've also got male parts. So the stamens, in the case of the pin flower, are short. They only come about halfway up, uh, and they're, so they're down there, and they've got the pollen on them. So that's what a pin flower looks like. A thrum flower looks rather different. So again, we'll just draw the, the flower itself. These are the petals. There's the stalk, and again, we cut away, and we're looking into the middle. And what we would see when we looked in to um, a thrum flower is we wouldn't see this tall stigma at the top. Instead, we would see a little group of five stamens and you would just see the anthers at the top and the pollen there. And they're quite close together in a little tight bunch. And the stigma, the female part, is all the way down here. So it's short. There's the stigma, here's the style, and then we have the ovary, and in there are the egg cells. So they have these very, this very strange system where they have two types of flower that, are, that look very different. And what's going on here is this is a way to ensure that pin can't pollinate itself and nor can thrum. So what pin is hoping is by having this long tall stigma here is that pollen from a thrum flower will be transferred across to a pin stigma by an insect that would just stay at the top of the flower. But if an insect forages deeper into the flower, then it will pick up pollen from there, from the pin flower, and when it visits a thrum flower, it'll put pollen onto that stigma. And that is what we call heterostyly. We get these two morphs, and they are designed to pollinate each other and not to allow self-pollination. And that is something that's actually quite common in plants. When we think about it, it's a little bit like having two different sexes. We have males and females, and males can only mate with females, and females can only mate with males. And this is the same thing. Pins can only mate with thrums, and thrums can only mate with pins. But strangely enough, that's happening within a system where everyone is hermaphrodite. Which makes you wonder, which is the better system? Is it better, from an evolutionary perspective, to have two sexes, or is it better to have this kind of self-incompatibility? 
So I want to try and explain now some of the costs involved with sex, and particularly the costs involved in producing males. So I want to imagine on this side is the sexual population, and here is a single individual female, and she's just arrived in a new environment. Perhaps she's a female fish who has the only arrival in an enormous new pond or ocean. So she's got this opportunity to be incredibly successful. And this fish happens to be pregnant, which is even better, so she's going to be able to have offspring without there being a male present at the moment. Now, she can only have two offspring, we're going to assume. And one's going to be female and one's going to be male. And as soon as she's had her offspring, she herself, unfortunately, dies. So we're just making some very simple assumptions. So in the next generation, there are two fish in my pond, and one's male and one's female. In the next generation, that female fish only is going to be able to have more offspring, but she's only going to be able to have two again, one female and one male. The males are important because they're fertilising the females and allowing them to have any offspring at all, but because they can't have offspring, every generation there's just two new fish, one female and one male, and this isn't really looking like a fantastic strategy. Now, of course, you could argue, well, but no fish can have only two offspring, and indeed they can't. But I just want to illustrate the point, because we're going to compare this now to what would happen if that female fish wasn't sexual, but was asexual. So here is a single fish, a single female fish who's arrived in this pond, and she's competing against the sexual female. But something's gone wrong in her genes so that she no longer has sex. She produces eggs where she just hands on all of her genetic material. And so they don't need fertilising by a male, and she too can only have two offspring, and then she dies. So in the first generation, there's her two female offspring, and she's dead. Now, in the next generation, both of those females can produce two female offspring. So in the next generation for this fish, there are now four of her offspring present. And each of those females can also produce two more offspring. And they're both going to be female. And so in that generation, there's now going to be eight new fish, all female. And it's pretty easy to see when you compare the sexual side to the asexual side, which is more successful. The asexual side is able to outgrow the sexual population very easily. And this is one of the so-called costs of sex. It's the cost of producing males, which, although they are necessary in a sexual population to provide sperm to fertilise eggs, they don't contribute to the population growth rate. And so it seems that producing males is a really costly strategy. So how do our primroses fit into this? Well, they're actually a little bit more like the asexual population. It's true that if a single primrose got into a field, well, it couldn't do very much. But if two individuals got in and one was pin and one was thrum, then they could cross-pollinate each other. And crucially, both of those individuals would be able to produce seeds and therefore contribute offspring to the next generation. So their population could grow very rapidly. Which really makes you wonder what's going on on the sexual side. Why do so many animals have a male and female system? Well, the answer to that is long and complicated and I don't want to go into it all now. But one of the key advantages of sex is so that you don't just produce clones of yourself. Instead, you mix your genetic material with that of other individuals in the population. And somehow that must generate a big enough advantage to offset some of these disadvantages. Of course, the primroses have got those advantages too, because by having this pin-thrum system, they are forced to mix their genetic material with that of other individuals, but they're not paying all of the costs of sex, which animals are. So they've come up with something really clever, and perhaps it's not surprising that lots of plants have a system like the primrose, where there are two different types, which can't mate within themselves, but can only mate across. They're not always a pin-thrum system, there's different ways of making it happen. But it's much more common in plants than having separate males and females. There are a few plants that do that, but it's pretty rare. So it just goes to show, we're not as drawn to plants, we always think they're a bit boring because they haven't got faces and they're not cute. But they do have some pretty cool biology. Let's try and end this piece where it began, back in the lawn where the primroses are growing. 
So what we learned is that primroses have this really unusual mating system, which is a bit like having different sexes and certainly has some of the advantages of having different sexes. But by being hermaphrodite, they're actually able to avoid some of the costs of sex because they don't produce males who can't then contribute to the next generation. Well, I hope you at home are able to go outside, even if only a little bit, during these very difficult times, and that you might be able to find some primroses growing in your garden or somewhere nearby. And if you do, have a look inside the flowers and see if you can work out whether they're pin or whether they're thrum. I've had a quick look round my garden and they mostly seem to be pin, strangely, and thrum, I don't seem to have very many of them. Cowslips are exactly the same, by the way. They also have a pin thrum system. So if you can't find primroses, but you can find cowslips, then you can do the same thing. All right, that's it for this time.